Okay, so um, I promised Pride Tunes I'd do a video um, about this. So, first, um, let me show you my rabbi. So, for a simple clarification, though, before I show you my rabbi, he says the word Israel. Israel is the Jewish diaspora nation, not the Zionist state. The Zionist state that calls itself Israel is not genuinely Israel. Israel is the entire Jewish diaspora nation around the world. So please bear this context in mind. Shalom, shalom. Thank you for visiting us here at West African Jews of the Diaspora Channel. I'm Rabbi Yehuda, and we have a very interesting discussion um, I would like to apologize because I haven't been as consistent as I wanted to or have liked to be. And um, here I am, though. I'm posting again, thanks to a good friend of mine, Nehemia bin Avraham on Facebook, who decided to share a link and a discussion from a Hebrew Israelite channel, which inspired this particular subject matter, if you believe it or not. And so it's very interesting and sometimes disheartening to watch a lot of people who are within the Hebrews like community or movement and are awakening, you know, to the fact of who they might be. I, I am not in the business of disenfranchising or being dismissive about anyone's oral traditions about who they are, but I am in the business about truth and about what Torah teaches. And so with that being said, this particular channel that was hosted by this one particular Hebrew Israelite, I don't know his name, but it's Deacon something. And um, the subject matter here was about the Yehudut, was about Judaism. And what they were clearly trying to demonstrate is that Judaism, the Talmud, the Mishnah, the Mishnah Torah, and the people when I taught masters, the Hakamim, they all taught racism, white supremacy, or they were prejudiced against black people. This is what they were promulgating on their particular YouTube channel. And I thought it would be the right thing for me to at least respond with the truth of the matter. Now, I have other videos about the Talmud. I also made a video about is the Talmud racist. I've also made other videos about the Talmud and the falsehoods. These are some of the things they actually brought up in their discussion on their particular channel that I've already, you know, already took care of and um, covered. So if you like, after this video, you can go and watch those videos. If you have any questions, if you want me to post follow-up videos, I'd be glad to do that. Um, but let's now focus on the accusation against Ramba. And the reason why I want to focus on this is because I hold Rambam and his teachings and his missionary Torah dear to my heart because he was a Torah master that lived between the 12th and 13th century CE. And he, to me, was one of the greatest Torah masters that lived on this planet. And not being dismissive about other Torah masters within the Yehudut, but Rambam, even Yosef Karo, the author of the Shuhan Aruch, stated that about Rambam. And this host of this particular Hebrew Israelite channel, you could tell he was an autodidact because he couldn't even pronounce Rambam's name. He couldn't even say Mamonides. Mamonides. He could. He couldn't even say that. He couldn't even say um, the the uh, Avodah Zarah. He couldn't even mention. You know, he tried to pronounce different Hebrew terms, and you could tell that he was not familiar with even the rules of pronunciation in Hebrew. Be as it may, he did attack Rambam and I'm here to defend Rambam. So Rambam was a, a, a scholar, a Torah master that lived in Spain and he lived around the 12th and 13th century CE and believe it or not, for a lot of you who do not know, this is during Moorish Spain. This is the time 
where you have interactions between Muslims and Jews more so than anything else. This was during the time in history that it was a colossal collaboration between Jews and Muslims and building all kinds of educational uh, edifices. And this was during the time the mathematics, science, and medicine excelled. And Rambam, not by chance, was one of the top physicians that lived in this time in Spain. And for many of you who like to accept, Rambam was a Moorish Jew in the sense of the fact that he was not an Ashkenazi, that he was most likely of dark complexion and many scholars that speak about the Spanish and Portuguese Jews during the time of the 12th and 13th century, they, they, have, they had a darker complexion. But being a Jew, I must add, is not about complexion at all. However, let's go on. And I just had to add that in though, because of the viewpoints of me Hebrew Israelites who are, I should say, obsessed with the fact that they're black and obsessed with the fact that European Jews are white. And therefore, they believe that even Rambam himself was one. And so, I'm not going to actually uh, delay this any further. Let's go within the text of the accusation about Rambam. And I'm going to prove that he was not racist using the very text that they cited. They actually cited from Rambam's work the Rambam has written many works besides the Mishnah Torah. But one of his other most important work is called the Morei Nevochim, which is uh, translated and also known as the Guide for the Perplex. And in chapter 51, in the Guide of the Perplex, there have been many um, English translations that has been published and there are slight variations within these English translations. So I must begin by this most cited translation. So here we are. It reads in one version, such are the claims. This is Rambam. This is a quotation from Rambam in English. Such are the claims or such are the extreme Turks that wander about in the north. The Kushites who live in the South and those in our country who are like these, I consider these as irrational beings and not as human beings. They are below mankind, but above monkeys. <gasps> wow. Since they have the form and shape of a man and a ment mental faculty above that of a monkey. And this is in Mori Nefokim, or this is in the English text, one of the English versions of the um, of the uh, guy for the perplex. Now let's pay attention. And this is what they hone in on. Such are the extreme Turks that went about the north, the Kushites, and this would this is where they become tunnel vision. The word Kushites, the Kushites who live in the south. All right, and you consider now, but what they don't pay attention is, and those in our country who are like these. Who is he? Rambam talking about the Turks in the north and allegedly the Kushites. So what is truly appalling is that there are at least two other versions of this text of this particular work that's been translated into English that says blacks or Negroes. OK, depending on which version you have. You might read, such are the extreme Turks that went in the north, the Negroes who live in the south, or you might have a text that says, such are the Turks who wander about in the north, and then it may use the word, the blacks who live in the south. So they interchange the word Kushites. Now it is clear that from reading this particular translation or these types of translation, that one can come off or leave with an understanding that Rambam was racist. And, and I, I don't blame a lot of the Hebrew Israelites or anybody else for that matter, Christians or even some Jews who may have a copy of this 
uh, Morin Nevochim, or as in English called um, the guy for the perplex, I, I can understand why you will walk off with this. And it's not your fault. It's whomever who decided to translate this into English and use racial overtones, or if you may, undertones, into Rambam's words. Because Rambam, if you look at the text from the writings of Rambam in the original language that Rambam wrote it, you find that Rambam wrote in Judeo-Arabic. And in, in the Judeo-Arabic language, he doesn't even mention Kushites at all. Huh? I know some of you are surprised. No, he doesn't. All right? He does mention the Turks, but he doesn't mention Kushites. He doesn't mention anything pertaining to any color of any particular person or group in this text. So this text has just been mistranslated. What does it really mean? And what, does, what is the context of Rambam and what he really meant when he wrote this? So let's examine that. So I'm going to read it from the Judaic Arabic. Rambam wrote, Al Turk al Metujalin fi al Samal, which says the Turks who wander around the north. While Sudan al Metujalin fi al Janub, the Sudanese who wander around the south. Notice, he did not say anything about Kushites. He said the Sudanese who won around in the South. So it's obvious that Rambam wasn't making comments about any black people in general, but about particular groups of people who were like the Turks, who was like the Sudanese that lived in that region or anyone who were like them in the context that did not possess a culture which will include morals and or education. And so it, this is what Rambam was referring to. He was referring to people who were like these. In this case, he was talking about the wandering Turks of the North and the Sudanese, right? So the biggest question though, and I should ask you guys to ponder on this, the biggest question in about this text, and it came to me, why and how these translators came up with the words like Kushites, Blacks, and Negroes in place of Sudanese? That's a subject for another time. Be as it may, what's incredible that all the English versions that are out there unanimously translate the word out Turk as Turks instead of whites. And there is no good reason that they should have done the same for the word Al Sudan. In other words, they use the words Kushite Negroes and Blacks for Sudan. They should have used the word whites. But let's assume for a moment that we can equate the word Sudanese as Blacks or Negroes or Kushites then one could conclude that Rambam was talking about black people. Then by the same logic, then one must conclude that he was also talking about white people because the Turks, right? For he mentions the Turks along with the Sudanese as being just above monkeys in this particular region because of their what? Of their lack of culture and education. So clearly this was a gross a mistranslation and a misrepresentation of Rambam, who was a righteous Torah master, and the misrepresentation of his words, which is totally taken out of context. And for many of you out there who fell for this out of ignorance, have committed a sin. Because you committed Lashon Hara, you spoke evil speech against someone who was innocent to racism. Now keep in mind, racism and white supremacy didn't even exist during the time of the Rambam. So how in the world can you believe, and that, I can even go further, it didn't even exist during the time of the Mishnah or the Talmud. So how in the world did you get this? I got you. I can answer that question for you. 
The reason why you got this racist ideology is because what people do generally, they take the goggles of the society and the world that they live in today, and they will interpolate those ideologies and those views upon something prior to what we experience today. In other words, when a person that lived long before racism, white supremacy, uh, before racism, white supremacy existed, says something about black or white, we automatically have a propensity to now accuse these people of racism, which is foreign to them. The Torah is foreign to it. The Tanakh is foreign to it. The Mishnah is foreign to it. The Talmud is foreign to it. And Rambam's Mishneh Torah is foreign to racism. And so I pray that when you do your research, consult experts, not just one, do not be selective. You have somebody, and it's funny because this particular Hebrew like host decided to cite from a Jew on YouTube who evidently did not understand or where they were opinionated about things they didn't understand and drew their own conclusion. But when you really do your research, there's more than one expert. There's more than one opinion and many experts will give you the fact. So let's consider this one dispelled. Rambam was not racist. Rambam did not practice racism and white supremacy. And all of you out there who thought he did, I understand. And I understand why. Because of the translation you read. But all you have to do is seek out a teacher. And I want you to do all to be careful because if you say that you sincerely want to serve the Hakodot Baruch Hu, you want to serve the Most High, the creator of heaven and earth, then you got to be very careful what you say about other people. So I will end this by saying if you haven't subscribed, hit the subscription button below, hit the notification button below, and you will, you will be notified every time you post a video. And I also like to end by saying, I pray that the Holy One, blessed be He, give you wisdom and understanding, guide your footsteps. So, if you are Israel and you want to return, that He will guide you in the correct path of returning to the splendor of His Torah. And that all of Israel will embrace you all and welcome you all back home. The Ezra Hashem, with the help of the Creator. May this be His will. And with that, I would like to say Shalom Mubarak. That is Rabbi Yehuda Moshe, and he represents, he represents the West African Jews of the Diaspora. Now the question that Pride Tombs had asked me about was if I could explain um, Black Jews in Israel. Well, okay, so um, the Jewish Black population with inside Israel, um, I mean, and, and you, you kind of have to clarify, do you mean uh, Jewish black, or do you mean Jewish African? Because if we mean black by the descendants of the slaves, uh, that's an entirely different matter. Ethiopian Jews have been completely assimilated. The ones that remain in Ethiopia have embraced Christianity, basically, and the ones within the Zionist state, while they converted to proper Judaism, although they did have a Judaism that, of their own that was Judaism, that Judaism no longer really exists. I mean, I'm sure there is some exceptions to this in, sm in small pockets in Ethiopia, but from what I understand, they're, di they're disappearing. Uh, because you cannot be both Jewish and Muslim, and you cannot be both Jewish and Christian. It's not possible. Um, now, according to Rabbi Yehuda, you could be both Jewish and Christian, and you could be both Jewish and Muslim, 
but you cannot be Jewish and Muslim at the same time, and you cannot be Jewish and Christian at the same time. Um, that's very generous of him. Um, but I take a more national approach on this, um, because the Jewish people, we are a diaspora nation. I do not like to engage with Jewish Muslims or Jewish Christians. Sometimes I do, because there might be certain affections I have for some, some individuals, but I, that doesn't mean I acknowledge, uh, I cannot acknowledge being both Jewish and Christian or being both Jewish and Muslim. That is a complete affront right there. Um, but the, the West African Jews of the diaspora um, do come from West Africa. Now, the black population in the settler colonial countries and Europe. All right, you have to also understand. You have to understand that for a period of a period of four hundred years, people were literally stolen from Africa and brought to Europe and the and the European settler colonial colonies. So some some black people are going to be more aware. Uh, of their African ancestry, and others are going to be completely cut off. Uh, the plight of the West African Jews of the diaspora has been a long, turbulent one. But because of, because of people like Rabbi Yehuda Moshe, there's been a lot of revival that has occurred. I particularly, the Siddur that I use is particularly from the West African Jews of the diaspora. And my rabbi is Rabbi Yehuda Moshe. And this is because Sephardim, Jewish Sephardim, um, we don't exactly see things the way that the Jewish Ashkenazi population does. And many of us have adopted the Ashkenazi position because since the creation of the State of Israel, there has been a cultural genocide upon Sephardic Jews. And those of us that will try to reconstruct our positions often will look for things from the Mizrahim or from the Jewish Africans of many sorts. But within the state of Israel, I'm going to clarify this. Israelis of color, or Hebrews, because I don't want to call them Israelis, because the only, um, and I will clarify something else here. Um, fortunately, Jason did say this, but if you want to hear it straight from the horse's mouth from the, from the voice of a Jewish person, I will clarify that the only group that has the right to call themselves Israeli are the Samaritans. Yes, the Samaritans are Palestinians, but they are the only true Israelis. The, the so-called Israelis are actually Hebrews because they have a language called Hebrew. Um, to refer to the, for this, for the Zionist country, for them to refer to their citizens as Israelis is defamatory to both Palestinians and the Jewish diaspora. And the true Jewish people are the Jewish diaspora. Um, it's not just that there's a disconnect between Judaism and Zionism. There is a separation that's been occurring between Zionist culture and Jewish culture. While several Hebrews may in fact be Jewish, a great many of them have converted to different religions within the state of Israel. This has happened. The Hebrews should be seen not as a, a ethnic group that is predominantly Jewish. First of all, there is no Jewish ethnicity. There isn't. There are ethnic groups that are predominantly Jewish, such as Sephardim, Mizrahim, Ashkenazim, uh, you know, have you uh, there. Um, but the Hebrews cannot be counted among them. But again, when I say the Hebrews, I'm referring to those that self-identify as Israeli. The Hebrew people are not a are not an ethnic group that is predominantly Jewish because too many of their numbers have converted to different uh, religions. What they are is they are a post what they are is post Jewish, and in many cases now even anti Jewish. But the the Jewish Ethiopians within the state of Israel are Zionist settlers. Having the dark skin doesn't make them less Zionist. In many instances, they're more Zionist. Not in all instances, though. I mean, some of the um, soldiers 
will be a bit more hesitant than others, but then other soldiers will be more aggressive than others. And I'm, of course, referring to Ethiopians here, Ethiopian Israelis, Hebrews. If you want to know, so within Europe, okay, within Europe and within Australia, New Zealand, uh, not as much, you don't have as much of them in Australia and New Zealand, you have, but there are some, but um, the African slaves, otherwise known as black people, um, who exist in the United, they exist in the United States, they exist in the United States of America, and they exist in Europe. I've said this before, that is the first world proletariat, not the industrial worker. I, I'll even go further and say that um, the first world proletariat of Europe was not only black, but it was even Jewish European. Yeah, you're saying that, you know, industrial workers in Germany and England were not exploited? Absolutely. They were not exploited. They were participants. Um, I think we need to reconfigure what proletarian means now and what it meant before. Because if the proletariat is what is exploited, how can you say that the Jewish Europeans were not exploited? This trope that we were all bankers and financiers is a fucking lie. Um, Karl Marx was a historical revisionist on several grounds. I will not take that back ever because he said shit that literally wasn't true. I mean, many of his, much of his historical analysis was true, but a lot of it wasn't. But within the state of Israel, is there an equivalent to black people, like black people in Europe and the United States and Canada? Is there an, do, is, does, does the state of Israel have its own equivalent to this? And the answer is yes, and that would be the Mizrahim. There are two types of Mizrahim in the state of Israel. The ultra-Orthodox Jewish and the Zionists. But the treatment that Mizrahim within the state of Israel get runs on an exact parallel to what black people go through in Europe, the United States, and Canada. So the equivalent within the Zionist state doesn't look exactly the same. However, now here's another factor for you to keep in mind. Several of the African Jewish people are Mizrahi, and several of the African Jewish people are also Sephardi. So you, you, you do have to keep that in mind. But if you're looking for dark skin, obviously black people, within the state of Israel, most of them are just as settler colonial as any of the others. Another thing that is um, taboo to say is that while the Sephardim within the Zionist state suffered a tremendous cultural genocide, the Zionist culture is mostly dependent on Sephardim. Sephardim do not have the same plight as Mizrahim in the state of Israel. There are some discriminations that they deal with, but, and the status quo, or more like it's bourgeoisie of the state of Israel, is definitely Ashkenazi. But, as far as the cultural strength of the state of Israel, it's almost exclusively Sephardi. The Israeli Black Panthers were pieces of shit. They did nothing. They did nothing. They said that they were going to bring their Mizrahi brothers in with them in the struggle. What happened? As soon as they got concessions, things only got worse for the Mizrahi. And that is because Sephardim are considered exotic and sexy. This could be viewed as a point of exploitation itself, except for the fact that Sephardim ride that shit and they ride it hard. I am Sephardi. And I have had a hard time getting my way back to a full Sephardi culture. When I was raised... Jewish as a teenager in Brooklyn, I was really taught by Ashkenazim. That's where I pick up Yiddish words. My ethnic background doesn't have any Yiddish in it. I picked that up as a teenager when I was in Brooklyn. I'm also probably the biggest embarrassment to Brooklyn Jewry in the world, but that's another story altogether. But um, it is very important to know that. When you're dealing with the state of Israel, there are lots of parallels that you can put between that, the United States, and other European settler colonial uh, systems. But you have to understand that racism is dealt with completely differently over there. Racism is manifested differently over there. 
This is this gets back to what I had said before in that video, uh, Jewish anti-Zionist. I don't deny the contradictions of class and race. I point out that they're both caste. It's all caste. And that is the problem with both Marxism and anarchism, is there's this avoiding of identifying what class and race is. Class and race are just different manifestations of caste. It's the caste system. It's the caste system. The feminist use of the term patriarchy is completely anti-Semitic. Who's the first patriarch? Abraham. There is no denying that there is a male show, a global male chauvinist system in place, which is part of the caste system. You have to separate women's liberation from feminism. Feminism is pretentious. Feminism is a flaw in Marxist movements. I, I, and I want to be fair here, not all versions of feminism are the same. There are versions of feminism that are more valid than others. But feminism was birthed as a white movement from the 19th century onward. Women's liberation has continuously emerged throughout history many times. Now, I um, have nothing more to say about feminism and its anti-Semitic use of the term patriarchy. Which, by the way, patriarchy refers to the rule of the matriarchs and patriarchs, as in the rule of the mothers and the fathers. But with that all said, getting back to the main topic, the, the black and African populations within the Zionist state um, are just as Zionist as anybody else. There is, a, however, a, a different contradiction that exists, and that's that there's dark-skinned African refugees that live within the state of Israel that are, that are consistently expelled because they threaten the Jewish character, apparently, of the Zionist state. The Zionist state can never stop having a threat to its Jewish character because it's not a Jewish state. It's, it's not. It's a Zionist state. It was done against the will collectively of Jewish people. Reform Judaism was just as anti-Zionist as Orthodox Judaism before the Holocaust. It was after the Holocaust, though, thanks to the successes of Zionist propaganda, that a lot of Reform Jewish people went completely Zionist. In the last 20 years, that has been reversed. In 2015, I could legitimately say that, okay, we're not quite at the majority, uh, that being us, Jewish anti-Zionists. We're not quite at the majority yet, but we are well on our way and we're catching up. Now we are the majority. And one of the things that people have an issue with on that is that is owed to two fractions of the Jewish people. That is owed to the ultra-Orthodox that everybody likes to make anti-Semitic movies about, like unorthodox and stuff. Um, and it's also owed to Boondism, which is getting more and more popular. In fact, recently, Dr. Weisfeld shared with me um, a link to something from the Real News Network that gives acknowledgement to the boon. That is a breakthrough. Now, again, I don't take back what I said, that all of these media platforms, such as like the, new, the Real News Network, Democracy Now!, uh, The Gray Zone, that they, they, they should be viewed with a critical eye. I don't take that back, because only far-left press can really be justified. But you have to understand far left means antagonistic to the system. You see, if the far left was to get its way, the left right paradigm would cease to exist. The whole point of being far left is to get rid of the paradigm. The paradigm is a measure of control. You know, um, the unfortunate part for being Jewish in the far left is that we know that the center-left, the center, and even the center-right are friendlier to Jewish people than the far-left. Not because the far-left is not correct, but because the far-left suffers with a cognitive dissonance when it comes to the Jewish people. The far-left doesn't like to deal with Jewish people. And that's largely because those that started the leftist positions were anti-Semitic by and large. Even though the right-wing and center does not benefit Jewish people, People like Marx and the, and the anarchists, they had a built-in hostility to Jewish people. Yes, but Marx was Jewish. Marx was a self-hating Jew. Get that right. 
Carl, the Karl Marx, the Karl Marxes, and the Leon Trotsky's of today are people like Rich Siegel and Gellert Otzman. I will never call myself a communist. This is all part of why. Now, communism as communists define it, okay, that's a different subject, but communist is connected to a word that is particularly un-Jewish. So, Jewish communists tend to be self-haters. There's a reason for that. It's because they should be Buddhists. If communists are so insistent on getting at the root of the truth, they need to learn to take criticism better. Anyway, the... I did this for Brightunes. Um... There's a link in the description to Rabbi Yehuda's channel, uh, West African Jews of the Diaspora. So you're not looking for black Israelis, you're looking for black Jews. And you can, you can check it out, the link in the description below will give you that. And the white man is still gay.